Hello friends. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to Go Agile Part 8. So last time we covered the first part of Scrum. And before we continue where we left last time, for a change, I want to relate what my friend Srinivas in Australia shared with me. An interesting analogy on how this Agile practice has been there for hundreds of years. Sometimes these little analogies helps us to strongly remember some of the concepts what we are trying to learn. So he says farmers in India were practicing Agile for hundreds of years. Initially, I couldn't believe it. But then when I heard the story, I found it very interesting. So I thought we'll share that with you. Every morning in a village, all the farmers who work for a landlord assemble at the landlord's house. They discuss about what they did yesterday, their observations, then what needs to be done today and what they need for their work today, things like uh, any tools, fertilizers, pesticides, whatever. This is just like your daily stand-up in uh, Scrum. Then they go out for farming and work all day. And for crops, especially commercial crops like uh, cotton, tobacco, millets, there will always be changes in the crop, especially with pest infections. Those infections spread so quickly that even just a 24-hour delay in action results in some damage. So they need swift action for those changes. So this is something just like how you handle requirement changes and how you respond to change as per the Agile Manifesto. So you are inspecting and adapting to new ways and changes to suit the new requirements. That is what we call inspect and adapt in Scrum. And then during their work in the fields, they normally meet at some point for tea or lunch or smoke, whatever, and discuss about their progress of work and update each other on their impediments. This gels very well with the power of agile face-to-face -face interactions. And also they try to mix these crops. So there's a constant rollout of the product all throughout the year. They may be mitigating the risk not to depend just on one crop for entire year. There could be seasonal uh, items too. That's somewhat similar to your regular shippable increments, right? Fascinating how the Agile connects to it. So, so the moral of the story is Agile is nothing but a mindset. Many across the world may be already practicing in their own ways and for many, many, many years. Though they may not use the word Agile, but they are practicing Agile. Just thought we'll share it. So back to our Scrum. In the last session, we covered Scrum roles and Scrum ceremonies. So there are three Scrum roles. Uh, scrum master, product owner, and developers. And in scrum ceremonies, we looked at four ceremonies, daily stand-up, sprint planning, review, and retrospective. There is one another ceremony called backlog refining, and I didn't cover it last time, because backlog refining is not an official scrum ceremony, but invariably, most of the teams carry out this, and it's a useful one. In the sprint planning, you are taking all certain stories, uh, calling them sprint backlog and then deep diving and estimating all that you are doing and all that stuff, right? Now imagine if you already did some refinement much before coming to sprint planning where you brainstorm the needs and prioritize to align with enterprise objectives, won't it be useful? So that is what you do in backlog refining, which you will do midway in a sprint. Clear, right? So you start a sprint with sprint planning. And let's say after a week, you, you, you meet again for some time to go over the product backlog items that may likely be the candidate requirements for the upcoming sprint. So these items can be developed during next sprint. By this, the advantage is when you go into next sprint planning, you don't have to spend much time in identifying what stories for that sprint. You can quickly jump into those prioritized stories and start estimating, breaking them down into tasks and, 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 and all that stuff. So in a nutshell, backlog refining will help you to be well prepared for the next sprint planning session. So after scrum ceremonies, next is scrum artifacts. There are four artifacts and people also call them work products. Scrum artifacts provide key information that the, that the scrum team and the stakeholders need to be aware of to understand product under development, the activities done and the activities being planned in the project. So what are the four artifacts? One is product backlog, two sprint backlog, three increment, and four burn down chart or metrics. See, now it becomes so easy because we already covered some of these things in the last session uh, while doing this sprint ceremonies. We covered a good bit of product backlog last time while discussing sprint planning. The product backlog is the indefinite list of all features that are needed as part of the end product and it is the single source of requirements for any changes to be made to the product. The product backlog lists all features, functions, requirements, enhancements, and uh, fixes that constitute the development 
or changes to be made to the product in future releases. So you will be adding all the requirements or changes here in this long list of backlog and it's an evolving artifact. These individual entities that you add into product backlog are called as user stories, which we reviewed last time. So who is responsible to maintain this product backlog? Obviously it is the product owner. Generally, those which are in the top have more clarity and more content because deeper discussions must be going on as they are the immediately needed functionality. As you go down the backlog, you may not have all details and they could be dependent on other parts of the organization or other uh, parts of development or there could be other dependencies which may happen in future. Clear, right? The next artifact is print backlog. So there is a product backlog and sprint backlog. It's fairly easy to guess the difference. So the product backlog is something that's the long list of uh, open requirements. And then in the stories that you shortlist to be developed in the current sprint, that's what we call sprint backlog. So it's basically there's no difference between product and uh, sprint backlog, except the stories which you leave it in the indefinite uh, long list, you call it the product backlog. And the stories which you shortlist and select to be developed for the current sprint, you call them sprint backlog. So it is the subset. Sprint backlog is the subset of product backlog items selected for the current sprint. Obviously, the sprint backlog is a kind of forecast by the team about what functionality will be made available in the current increment and the work needed to deliver that functionality as a working product increment. So once you finalize the items for current sprint, then ideally you should not make any changes to the scope. By any chance, if product owner wants any changes, Scrum Master should try his or her best to resist any changes. It's generally not a good practice to make changes within the sprint. Scope churn results in many issues. Velocity takes a hit, project timelines can get disturbed, and there are other implications which we'll review later when we cover some advanced topics. Sometimes team may request some changes as they are not able to complete for many reasons. That negotiation happens within the team and together with the product owner and scrum master. Team will decide on the best course, whether uh, to drop stories or to replace, etc., etc. but that should be an exception. So the next artifact is increment. The increment is the sum of all the product backlog items completed during a sprint combined with the increments of all the previous sprints. As you move from sprint to sprint, you are accumulating all the completed work after every sprint, right? So that combined product is what we normally call increment. It's a combination of iterative and incremental approach. Earlier, we strictly used to distinguish iterative versus incremental. Best way for you to understand difference between iterative and incremental is, I will use the standard example that everyone uses. Imagine you have to paint a wall. There are two ways you can approach. In an iterative world, you would paint the complete wall with one coat. Next week, you will come back and you will give a second coat and then you will call it done. In incremental world, what you would do is, first week you paint both coats fully on half of the wall. So by the end of the first week, that half portion is fully ready. It's done. So that's it, some sort of finished increment. Next week, you complete the balance half with both quotes and then you call it done. And that's another increment. Basically, within two increments, you are completely finishing the wall, each half separately. Whereas in Scrum, it's a combination of iterative and incremental. That's what many people see it as an advantage. As a process, Scrum gives you the flexibility to be iterative and also incremental. The best way to interpret is in Scrum, you can produce a potentially shippable increment, even though you may not release it, but it could be potentially shippable, meaning it's ready at the same time. And if needed, you can also roll out the increment to some users. So you are getting best of both. So one thing is clear at the end of a sprint, the new increment must be a working product, which means it must be in usable condition, regardless of whether the product owner decides to actually release it or not. But the scrum team should have full consensus on what is considered to be an increment. This varies significantly per scrum team, but team members must have a shared understanding of what it means to work for, for, for them to call the work as complete. That is what we call the done criteria. The last artifact is sprint burndown chart. Basically, this is one chart which tells you how much work is left in the sprint. Every day when you see the chart for a quick minute, it can show if the work is correctly progressing with the rest of the days left in the sprint, which only helps you to track the progress right towards the sprint goal. I'm not going into a lot of detail at this stage because I'll see if I can cover all metrics again at some point. And the last is Scrum Values. 
By the way, last time I think there was a typo and I just mentioned four scrum values, but actually it's five scrum values, not four. So what are the five scrum values? They're commitment, courage, focus, openness, and respect. Commitment. The scrum value of commitment is essential for building an agile culture. Scrum teams work together as a unit. We saw that enough, right? This means that the scrum team trust each other to follow through on what they say they are going to do. When team members are not sure how work is going, they ask. Agile teams only agree to take on tasks they believe they can complete. So they are careful not to overcommit. So scrum masters have to pay great attention, particularly during sprint planning, to make sure team commits what they can deliver. Likewise, product owner also stays committed to avoid scope churn during a sprint. They, they should not just like that make you know ad hoc changes to the uh, scope in between a sprint. The next one is courage. The scrum value of courage is critical to an agile team's success. Scrum teams must feel safe enough to say no. Agile teams must be brave enough to question the status quo when it hampers their ability to succeed. In our uh, older culture, we are used to saying yes to everything and that results in wrong commitment and failed delivery. So teams should feel safer to put their thoughts openly. Uh, same way, scrum masters also should have courage to negotiate and sometimes put their foot down when unreasonable demands come from the business or if there is lack of support from other teams where there are certain dependencies. It boils down to the culture and leadership of the enterprise to create that safety in the environment. So the next is focus. Focus is one of the best skills in a scrum team. Focus here means whatever the team starts, they have to finish it. They should not leave it halfway. You remember we discussed about work in progress earlier. So scrum teams should always be cognizant of the fact about limiting the work in progress. And focus is one of the best skills scrum teams can develop. Scrum masters again have a great role in encouraging teams focus by holding them to their own definition of done. And this starts right with your daily scrums. By being punctual, by attending every daily scrum, by tracking the burn down chart, teams can be more focused to stay on target. Next is openness. Openness is a good quality even generally too. Scrum teams uh, consistently seek out new ideas and opportunities to learn. When they have some issues or difficulties, they should communicate openly and seek help. Scrum masters play an important role to facilitate openness in daily scrum, so team is exactly aware of how they are progressing. There is no hiding of the challenges. Likewise, even during sprint review, the stakeholders' feedback should be constructive in a way the team understands and adopts to the changes. Finally, retrospective is an event where teams should be very open and talk honestly on what went well, what didn't go well, etc. Scrum Master is again has a great responsibility in encouraging openness. Next is respect. It's all the more important that Scrum teams demonstrate highest levels of respect. Agile development is all about collaboration. Everyone is equally important. Everyone has ideas and opinions. So members should have utmost respect for everyone else. Sometimes people may lose patience or may have a bad day and teams should be understanding and respect each other. On the same token, when there is an accomplishment, no matter how small, they should openly recognize and appreciate any accomplishments. Again, a matured scrum master should play an important role to inculcate that respect in the team. You may be thinking that these values all look very broad and generic we hear all the time. True, but scrum founders did a good job by incorporating these values also as a major part of scrum theory. Because all said and done, attitude matters a lot. And these values certainly help bring right attitude which will have great results in the long run. We reviewed in Kanban that making policies explicitly is a key thing. So here Scrum founders are explicitly conveying that there are some things called values and you better get aligned with these values if you want to be in an agile world. So once again to summarize, Scrum has four things mainly, Scrum roles, ceremonies, artifacts and values. So with that we covered the main overview of what a Scrum is. Now there is a lot of additional scrum related stuff and we will try to cover some if not all in the upcoming sessions. By the way, I'm getting lots of private messages appreciating the series and the content. My humble request to all, a comment would be very motivating but at the least, if you can like the video, it's highly appreciated. Because my only earning that I eagerly look forward to is your comments and likes. So with that, we will conclude this Go Agile 8 and till we meet again in Go Agile 9, take care, stay safe and happy scrumming. See ya. Thank you.